The sports generals are on patrol. I am the main host, Unger to the Max. That is my co-host, C-Boss. Hello. Uh, the, my other co-host, the official host of Mana Lakes as usual, Jason, should be joining hopefully shortly. But um, we appreciate you joining us. We know that the Hall of Fame game is on. Well, at least it's supposed to be, but right now I believe it's actually in a weather delay. Ooh. And is Canton getting hit that bad with rain? Yes. I can actually look right now. Um I don't I don't have the volume on because I don't want it distracting me, but I'm looking over and right now I just see Mike Tarico and Chris Collinsworth on commentary, so don't know if that means the game is on or what. But anyway, we also know that BattleBots, the champions, is starting tonight. So thank you for choosing to watch us instead of the Hall of Fame game or the new season of BattleBots. Which, if you haven't seen that show, it's fantastic. It is basically just the robot equivalent of the UFC. It is fantastic. But enough about that, because Discovery Channel is not giving me any endorsements or anything. I would love it <laughs> if they did, but they're not. So, to start the show, we act unfortunately have to start out on a bit of a somber note, because we lost two giants in the sports world this week. Actually, two legendary sports giants this week. First... 11-time NBA champion Bill Russell passed away at the age of 88. And then, at the age of 94, longtime Los Angeles Dodgers broadcaster Vin Scully passed away. Yeah, it's, it's sad to see two legends in the sports community pass. It really is. Um... I mean, for God's sake, Bill Russell has a trophy named after him now. I believe it is the NBA Finals trophy, if I remember correct. NBA Finals MVP trophy that they received. I think you're correct. We can double check on that. But with Vin Scully, I mean, you turn on a Los Angeles Dodgers game, you expected it to be Vin Scully on the call. Right? Pretty much. Yeah. And he had his trademark line. It's time for Dodger baseball. Even if you didn't like the Dodgers, or I should say, even if you don't like the Dodgers, it you still should appreciate Vin Scully and what he Of course. What he did for Major League Baseball and for the Dodgers. Yeah, it's always hard to see a long-time commentator, you know, hang it up or all that. I mean, the Cavs experienced that how many years ago with uh, Joe Tate? Oh, man. I don't remember. And then the Cavs experienced it again when, oh, who was the, um, the TV, the TV guy that was always with Jim Jones, or Austin Carr. I'm trying to run. I, I don't even know the name. Well, here's Jason. Maybe he can help us. What's up, Jay? What's going on, fellas? Sorry Hello. For the What's no up? No problem. We were just talking about the two somber notes that we experienced this week. Bill Russell and Vin Scully both passed away. Yeah, rest in peace to the both of the legends, the icons. Um, Bill Russell, for one, changed the game of basketball. Uh, what a pioneer to uh, excellence, you know. And I remember, I recall one moment when he, um, you know, when he was coming out to uh, do an introduction for one of the All Star games, and you know, they gave they went through the big spiel of you know. 11-time world champion, MVP, um, multiple all-stars. And he said, you know what? Don't call me that. Just call me the, call me the team captain. You know, and, and just little things like that that let you know that 
Bill Russell was more than um, just being a part of uh, what his brand was. It was more about what the game is, you know, and man, it's, we're going to absolutely miss him. Um, in regards to uh, Vince Scully, uh, absolute treasure. He was one of the only um, announcers that called the game by himself. Like, and for those at home that don't really know how it is to do play by play, that's a beast in his own. But to be able to come up with um, stuff that's going on behind closed doors, pay your favorite players, favorite things to do at home, and just the little things that you take for granted. This Scully, he did it all, and he had probably one of the best voices, pure voices in the game, bar none. So, uh, absolutely, RIP to two extremely wonderful icons. Yeah. Um, by the way, Chris, I figured it out. It was Fred McLeod. Okay. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Because we were talking about how, like, Vin Scully was the voice of the Dodgers for 67 years. Mm-hmm. So when you turn, when you tuned into a Los Angeles Dodgers game, you're like, I know Vin Scully is going to be on the call for this game. Right. And, and we were talking about it like when a legendary commentator, you know, does it or like stops commentary for whatever reason, whether it be retirement or unfortunately in Scully's case passing away, that like it, it kind of affects the entire sports community. And I was saying that the Cavs went through a similar thing when Joe Tate hung hung it up. Oh, yes, Joe Tate. That Now, Joe Tate, <laughs> for those at home, just to hear his voice, man, that right there, he, he is the essence of Cavalier basketball. I mean, a lot of, like, the new, um, new of age um, followers and fans, they may think of Austin Carr as Mr. Cavalier, which that's true to a degree. Uh, but if you didn't have a TV, if you didn't have cable, um, if you were – Working late, and you had to turn on WK, WKA, I mean, 850 AM, WKNR. You heard Joe Tay's voice, and his voice is just like, it's, 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 it's such a soothing thing to listen to. So you can listen to, um, if it's raining outside, you're trying to go to sleep, play Joe, to- Joe Tay's voice. <laughs> yeah. When you, when you tuned into WTAM 1100. Mm-hmm. Um, and just so to clarify, Vin Scully retired. From broadcasting in 2016, his final game was fittingly uh, a game between the Los Angeles Dodgers and the San Francisco Giants in San Francisco. Because, and I say that was a fitting game for him to end his career on, because being that he was the Dodgers broadcaster, he was involved in arguably one of the greatest rivalries in all of sports with the LA Dodgers and San Francisco Giants. They've had so many like legendary games against each other. It's a historic rivalry. For, so for Scully's final game to be in San Francisco between the Dodgers and Giants. Oh could, yeah, that's definitely a huge thing. That yeah. is absolutely the, the only thing that could have made it better is if the game was in Los Angeles. Yeah. I totally agree. Totally but, agree. But for it to but let's not we're not trying to diminish Vin Scully by any means here. So for those of you watching, please don't interpret what we're saying as we're devaluing Vin Scully by any means. We're yeah. just discussing his legacy and you know Talking about some of the good points, and plus, exactly. it's, it's, it's it's impossible to devalue and to diminish what that legend meant to the game and just his work in general. So, um, you can't, for whoever's watches, you can't take that as uh, someone diminishing um, his value at all. Correct. We're just saying it would have been cooler if if the if his final game was at Dodger Stadium. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would have been a more storybook ending. 
Correct, but it's still a storybook ending in itself for it to be oh, yeah. Dodgers Giants. Yeah. yeah. And going back to Bill Russell, you know, there was a point in the 60s where he won, I believe it was eight consecutive championships. That is correct. Eight in a row. And then he didn't win in 67. He comes back and wins two consecutive in 1968 and 1969. But here's the interesting part with that. Not only was he a player for the Boston Celtics in 1968 and 1969, but he was also the coach. Yeah, he was one of the first players. Actually, he was the first player, uh, the player coach to play in basketball. And uh, he was fair. (laughs) <laughs> he made the proper adjustments, but he, of course, still was the centerpiece for the Celtics at that time. So, Correct. Yeah. And check this out. I actually just learned this today while I was doing research for my newsletter that I send out every Thursday night, Friday morning called The Sports Room. Sign up if you haven't. But I know that's a cheap plug. But anyway, <laughs> apparent, apparently Bill Russell was not drafted by the Boston Celtics. He was traded to Boston after the St. Louis Hawks drafted him number two overall. Interesting. Awesome. Yeah, very, very, very interesting tad bit. Yeah, but again, he didn't play a second for St. Louis as he was traded to Boston. However... In the 56-57 season, he didn't make his debut until December because he had commitments with the Olympics. Yeah, that's very interesting, man. Very interesting. And the man has, again, he's been through a lot. Just just in general, just from seeing the uh, change of the civil rights uh, being incorporated into um, just transitioning into how day-to-day life is today you know he's been a part of everything you can imagine and it's just going to be very very surreal not to see him on the sideline come finals come to all-star games and then also um magic johnson made a reference about potentially retiring his jersey number and i'm on board with that a thousand percent you what you, what jersey number did he have uh, number six. six okay i would i would actually be okay with that um. So you're you saying. Should... So you're oh, saying sorry. retire. You're saying they should. The his number should be retired league wide. Yes. Yes, that's what Magic Johnson was clamoring for, and absolutely, um, I am okay and on board with his number being retired, which would mean, okay, what about LeBron James, right? Well, I mean, I'm sure he has another number he could wear, so. <laughs> Yes, that's exactly what that means. Gotcha. It, what were you, you going to say? It's about – um. I'm on board with it because not only is Bill Russell one of the greatest pioneers of the sport, he's also – like when you think of the end – like the early days of the NBA – what names come into your head? I think usually like Jerry West is one of those names, but Bill Russell is definitely like, the first one that pops into my head. Bill Russell used to take care of this guy that had all the records in the rule in the record book, Mr. Uh, Wilt Chamberlain. Um, he used to handle him decisively, and it was more of a, you know, it's not all about uh, physique and. Uh, strength is about the technique, the um, skills, the fundamentals, and that's something that Bill Russell always would have the upper edge over Will Chamberlain on. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I mentioned this earlier. I'm pretty sure they changed, they renamed the Finals MVP trophy to be called the Bill Russell Award or some somewhere. Something close to that, right? Yeah, they actually did. They did that um, a couple of years ago uh, to play homage to uh, Mr. Bill Russell. And, um, yes, that's been the motto ever since. Yeah. Um, It's going to be weird not seeing Bill Russell 
walk up on the stage after a team wins a championship and give the finals MVP trophy to whoever won it. Because I feel like as lo- for as long as I rem- can remember anyway, he did that. Yeah, I've, I've seen the same thing for as long as I, I can remember as well. Yeah. So, just wanted to pay yeah, tribute. He's always, um, you know, again, he is, he's revolutionized the game of basketball in general. And he's taught us, and when I say us, all true basketball fans, um, he's taught us how to be professionals how to conduct yourself, how to act, act like you've been here before. You know, we always hear that saying, act like you've been here before. Um, if you go out with your parents, hey, don't touch everything. You're like you, <laughs> act like you've been there before. And that saying is all resonating with winning. And Bill Russell is absolutely the centerpiece of the Boston Celtics. Or Rich, I mean, Ray Otterbach was the head coach there. And he won. 11 titles and every title that he will win you would never think that that was his first i mean his like billionth title because he had like it was his first championship uh but he always had that that class and something he carried on and off the court Mm -hmm. so we just wanted to take the time to pay tribute to both bill russell and vin scully we'd be remiss if we didn't um, but before we move on, just want to give you a quick update. The Hall of Fame game between the Jacksonville Jaguars and Las Vegas Raiders is currently in a weather delay. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So, looks like we lost Jason. Hopefully, he'll get back on. But uh, speaking of the NFL, we gotta, we're transitioning to a segment we're calling Trouble in the NFL jungle. This has nothing to do with the Cincinnati Bengals. I just thought it was a nice play on words. So, hey, it works. So roll with me on it. All right, cool. So is this Deshaun Watson saga ever going to reach a conclusion? Because Judge Sue Robinson came down with her ruling. Watson is suspended the first six games of the season meaning he would miss at Carolina, home against the Jets, Thursday night football, home against the Steelers, at Atlanta, home against the Chargers, and home against the Patriots, and he would make his debut week seven against Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens at M&T Bank Stadium in Baltimore, Maryland. However, the NFL said, No, we're not satisfied with that ruling, and they have appealed it. So, you know how there's that song, this is the song that doesn't end? You know that song, right? Yeah. How about this? This is the saga that doesn't end. And to add a bit more fuel to the saga... The NFL Players Association is throwing a lawsuit at the league over their appeal of the suspension ruling. Yeah, so this whole thing is a mess. I, I'm i just so tired of talking about it. Like, I, if, if we're not going to see Deshaun Watson on the field at all, just tell us that. If we are going to see Deshaun Watson on the field at some point, tell us that. I get it. It's not that easy to say that because there's clearly a lot to the process. But still, it, I feel like, w- excuse me, we as the fans are being left in the dark way too much. You agree with that? I I completely agree with that. Like, we want to know as much as everyone else does. If Roger Goodell, I believe Roger Goodell was the one who hired Sue Robinson to make the ruling. Why, if she made a fair ruling, why then try to appeal it when you're the one who hired her? 
as a commissioner, if you're going against a person you hired for a specific thing, that's not a good look on you as a commissioner or even that's not a good look on the league as a whole. If you're going against someone you hired to do a specific thing, they did that thing and now you are going against it. That's just not a good look. Right. And we've got Jason back, so we'll bring him into the conversation. Sorry We're about just that. no problem. <laughs> uh, quick update. It it says kickoff between the Jaguars and Raiders is it set for eight forty. Eight forty. Wow. Yes. But yep. just to catch you up, Jay, we're talking about the whole Deshaun Watson saga situation. I don't know what other word you want to use, but Sue Robinson, she comes out down with the ruling on, I think it was like Monday morning or whatever it was. Sometime earlier this week, we'll go with that, and says Deshaun Watson is to be suspended six games, meaning... Watson would make his debut week seven against Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Or at least that's what we thought because the NFL came, came back the other way and said, nope, we are going to appeal that suspension. However, Roger Goodell is not going to oversee the appeal. I don't, I don't remember who, what judge is overseeing the appeal. But then the NFL Players Association is coming back the other way and saying, okay, you're going to appeal. We're going to take this to federal court and sue you. So <clears throat> my mind is just ready to explode. And yeah. Jay, as I think you used this as Therapy Thursday or once before in the show, but it <laughs> totally applies here. Yes, it does. Stop leaving us as fans in the dark. Like, we want to know what's happening. Is Deshaun Watson going to play? Is he not? Just, I know it's not that simple to just say, no, he's not going to play, or yes, he is going to play, but just tell us. Yeah, it's like you're leaving the fans in the dark. You're leaving the Browns in the dark. And most importantly, you're leaving... Uh, the accusers as well as the victims in the dark. And it's like, everybody needs an answer to this. And um, yes, there was a ruling. The ruling was six games was going to be uh, recommended by Sue Robinson, who again was point appointed by the NFL um, and her findings. She indicated that uh, he did break some, or he did break, the codes of the NFL um, player violations of uh, misconduct. Uh, but because this was considered a nonviolent offense, uh, there's no laws in the bylaws of the NFL that said that a player could be suspended for an entire year for a nonviolent type of infraction. And this was nonviolent. So uh, based off of the letter of the, of the law of the rules in the NFL playbook, she said, okay, yes, he violated the rules, but we're only going to give him six games. Um, it kind of felt like she was basing it off of like, okay, there's still four um, other um, accusers that indicated that they, um, well, they didn't settle uh, like the other um, settled cases was. So yeah. she starts like a game and a half or whatever, but you can't really dictate because this is like an unprecedented type of, uh, case. But the problem that I ran into, guys, is this. NFL knew about this last year. They knew about this when the Texans knew about this and the Texans decided not to play him. He was still getting paid each week. And I'm not sure if the fans at home are aware of this, but he was getting paid a game check every single week. They basically were paying him to stay at home. NFL knew about this. NFL was hesitant. They didn't get behind this when this initially happened. They wanted to wait and let the legal process play out. And if we fast forward all the way to now, now because of the public outcry and everyone is um, have mixed emotions about what's going on, now Roger Goodell wants to put on the Oh, okay. You know what? We do care. We do care about our image. We do care about the brand of the NFL. So, uh, you know what? 
this just isn't good enough for us. But the problem with Roger Goodell is you guys put Sue Robinson in this case in the first place. The only reason she was doing this was because of the new CBA that was negotiated from management as well as from the Players Association. So when you do this, now you're undermining her decision and saying, you know what? She gave us a ruling, but that's not good enough for us. Let's go to our plan B option. It's like, okay, if this happened to somebody else, is this going to happen to us too? Because obviously the NFL doesn't care about what we already negotiated, and this is the first case of its nature. So it's so much confusion, man. I, I need me a, a beer. Yeah, I <laughs> understandable. I definitely need me a beer to get through this Here's- uh, situation. Here's something I had noticed when, like, the first cases came out about the Deshaun Watson thing. Like, I remember hearing something somewhere that the lawyer that some of these women or that, like, a majority of the women went to was friends or is friends with the Texans owner. And all this, like, (laughs) all, all this started coming out when Deshaun Watson was holding out for a bigger contract with the Texans. My guy, you nailed it. Right on the button. And I've been doing some investigating on this. Not only are you right about this, right? Okay. It's the same lawyer that represents every single woman in this particular um, trial setting, right? Um, I'm not sure if you guys watch this show called Better Call Sal, okay? But I've heard this, of it. <laughs> this reminds me of the type of legal practices that Saul Goodman were running his own office and that's something made up. It is it's such a grimy type of lawyer company, but it's like, this is the fresh from the Saul Goodman playbook. You guys are, you represent the same women in separate cases. So it's not a class action lawsuit. That's the first thing. And then secondly, it's like, is this a pay? Is this a cash grab? Because we all know that lawyers get a, a percentage of, whatever the ruling is, right? So if you're getting, let's say, 10, 15, 20%, and we got, see, one, two, three, four, 24 women, and I'm representing all 24 of these women, hmm, I'm probably going to take my wife out to dinner. Yeah. Right. Again, I get it. It's not as simple as, you know, he outright saying he's not going to play or outright saying, yes, he is going to play, but... At the same time, it's like, just tell us what's going to happen. You know, I wrote an article um, for Dog Pound Daily, which is the Cleveland Browns page on fan side. I, it got published before it was announced that the NFL was appealing the six-game suspension. So I was just basing the article off of, you know, the fact that Watson was suspended for the first six games. Um. But think about this. If that six-game suspension were to have stood and the NFL didn't appeal, Watson would have made his season debut by being thrown right into the AFC North Fire Brigade. Because in Week 7, he would have made his debut on the road at m t Bank Stadium against, I guess, the former Browns, or whatever you want to say, the team that I consider to be the Browns' biggest rival, they wear purple and black. They've had led to amazing players throughout their franchise history, like Ray Lewis, Terrell Suggs, Ed Reed. I think we know who you're talking about. Yeah, the Baltimore <laughs> Ravens. Right. And, and then, get this, week eight, the Browns come home and they play on Monday Night Football against the team that represented the AFC in the Super Bowl last year. Jamar Chase is their one is their best wide receiver. Joe Burrow is their quarterback. They're about four hours, I think, away from Cleveland. Yeah, the Cincinnati yeah, Bengals. Right. Yeah, and, and you know what? And, and another thing that the NFL, with them doing this appeal, this also opens up the can of worms of if – if Deshaun Watson and his camp decide to go ahead and um, sue or have a civil suit against the NFL and uh, for the ruling, uh, they can get an injunction, which would allow him to play in the first game of the year 
against the Carolina Panthers, which if everything works itself out and if Baker Mayfield is able to beat out Sam Darnold, we're looking at a potential clashing of Baker Mayfield versus Sean Watson and how the whole divorce started and where we're at now. So, Right. Which would be very I, – I think that game would be very fun to watch if both Deshaun and Baker were on the field for that. <laughs> Got to flex it. <laughs> they don't fl- I don't think flexing starts happening until week five or week six, but I hear what you say. Yeah, I've seen definitely. I've seen I've seen flexes happen in uh, week four. I think week four is when flexing can start. I can look that up. Um, we can just double check on Fle- it. What, if Deshaun's back for the whole season, just flex every game in his Sunday night. <laughs> 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 Man, listen, yeah, that'll be that'll be good. But uh, you know, I'm I'm realistically thinking if the six games is an uphill, probably eight or nine, and I think it's more of a it's all it's all about image and, and public perception. And I think the league is really doing is just to say, hey, we tried. Um, yes, we know everybody's not happy, but you know. The legal process played itself out, and all we could get was eight or nine games out of the deal. Uh, but it's their fault, man, because they should have been handled this last year. And they were cowards, and they were scared to hand out a ruling at that time. So I have no mercy on the NFL. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. They're like, we shouldn't even be in this situation. This should have been handled last season and last season only. And on top of that, you know, this just shows the discre- yeah, discrepancy. Wanted to make sure that was the right word between the players and the owners. Because I know the whole Robert Kraft situation wasn't quite to this level. But I'm pretty sure Robert Kraft, the Patriots owner, was in a similar situation, if I'm remembering correctly. Right. You absolutely yes, he right, was. Huh? You're right, and, and you know what? And what what does it say? This says that okay, in in the in the rule book, it says that they hold the owners at a higher standard than the players because it's of course the integrity of the league that's impacted. But this is obviously showing that it's not an even playing field for ownership and the players. And we all know Roger Goodell, who's back, he really has in the matter. So yeah, um, and you know. You think that's where that whole thing stops, but it doesn't. Because later, or at some point during the week, it was announced that the Miami Dolphins were being punished. Although they weren't punished for allegedly tanking. Instead, they were punished for tampering. Because they tampered trying to, when Tom Brady was still with the Patriots in 2019, they did it again with Tom Brady in 2021 while he was with the Buccaneers. And they did it with Sean Payton trying to bring him in as their next head coach. Um, But their punishment, they lose their first round pick in 2023. They lose a third round pick in 2024. Owner Stephen Ross is suspended through October 17th. And Ross was also fined $1.5 million. I think there was another part of the the suspension, but I don't remember that part off the the top of my head. Go ahead. I I do have a question about, like, when an owner gets suspended, what what exactly are they suspended from? (laughs) Exactly. Just coming to the actual um, press box and watching their team play. Oh, okay. Yeah. And there's not supposed to have like a Jerry, like a Jerry Jones. He wouldn't be able to come into like the facility or whatever. And that probably would impact him more, but it's a slap in the face, man. It's like only till October. You know what I mean? Like a million dollars. You know what that is to these owners? That's like, like 50 cents to a hardworking citizen. So (laughs) yeah. Like, Oh no, you suspend you find me one and a half million dollars. Guess what? I still have, I don't know, four hundred fifty-five million still. Yeah, in, just in about my Swiss yeah. Account, in my Swiss account. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but that's not a big deal. So let me ask not. you this. Overall, was that punishment fair? Or should it have been harsher? Or do you think it, the, the NFL gave gave too harsh of a punishment to the Dolphins? Nah, I think it was too... I, you know what? It, it's it, it for one. It, it lets you know how muddy the waters is for the NFL as far as dishing out punishments, right? Um, but you can't. And, and, and when they handed out the suspension, this was just a coincidence. It was the same day that the appealing um, decision came out, so they tried to hurry up and slip that under the cracks, like we wasn't going to notice that. Oh, you only right. gonna, you only going to do this to them, but. No, I, I feel like that the league um, was too lenient on him. Um, I felt that that par- punishment was uh, very, very like lax. Like, I mean, if you was gonna spend, if you was gonna take a draft pick, why not take this year's draft pick? What if they are good this year, which they are projected to be a playoff team, right? So you talking about you're gonna take away a, a pick that's like twenty third or below? Like, what the hell is that doing? It's like a second-round pick. So, they ain't really doing nothing. You know what I mean? So, again, it just lets you know that Roger Goodell picks and chooses who he wants to penalize and make um, an example of. And uh, we are living proof of that with the Deshaun Watson comparison to um, ownership of the Miami Dolphins. And also the whole Calvin Ridley thing. I mean, he bet some parlays on his team and About just got a, a whole year. A thousand dollars. A thousand dollars on the Atlanta Falcons. You get suspended for a whole year. Yeah, that's wild, man. That just goes to show. Don't bet on the Atlanta Falcons. It <laughs> might cost you. <ya>. But <laughs> I think what it also shows on that note, Chris, is you know there's not a there doesn't seem to be a standard for what constitutes certain punishments because. Let me get this straight. Like, Calvin Ridley, who you just brought up, is going to get a year for just laying parlays. Um, but you can't make up your mind on what to do with Deshaun Watson. The only, thing, only reason I say I just, like, oh, well, I want to take a different, I want you all to take a different uh, look at this is because, and this is just across the entire platform, sports in general. Uh, with Pete Rose of ban- you know, gambling, he's still not in the Hall of Fame for Major League Baseball. But in every locker room that you go to, everyone, and this is like crystal clear in, in the rookie symposiums, you're not supposed to bet on the sport, period. And they all know this. Now, do some of them still have their cousin John John or somebody go bet? Probably so. But you aren't supposed to take your ID and go there, and you can't do that. And unfortunately, yes, he got a whole season for it, but he knows he's not supposed to be betting on the games, and everybody in sports know that. So that is, it's like that's different versus this is something a little unprecedented with 24 accusations. Like, what the hell is that about? It's a little different, you know what I mean? Right. Okay, right. Quick question. Who the heck is John John? <laughs> <laughs> hey, just an example of some. Okay. We we all got a John John in our family somewhere, and everybody at oh, home yeah. watching, they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. uh, I I know I know exactly the one in my family too. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, I trust me. Uh, I get it. like you know this whole Deshaun Watson thing is unprecedented. So I totally get where you're coming from, Jay. But by the same token, it's like, again, you know, we had a similar situation with Robert Kraft. Granted, I say similar, not the same, because there's definitely some some differences. But, again, like, Calvin Ridley gets suspended for a year. I believe DeAndre Hopkins, who got busted for PEDs, got what? Eight games this season? No, some, I think six. Some he yeah. got suspended for he got suspended for some amount of games. We can look mm. that up later. But anyway, like each of these suspensions has been a different number of games. 
And again, I get it. Each situation is different, but mm. I would just like some t- sense of um, consistency. Correct. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it, the fact that the NFL did appeal this. Um, I was thinking at first, like, oh, Roger Goodell's probably about to step in and, and he's going to try to put the hammer down. But it was actually uh, one of his boys um, who was actually an attorney. He's going to be the um, arbitrator for it. Uh, I can't think of his name at the top of my head, but um, he's helped the NFL in the past with a certain um, one of these type of um, punishments that had to be handed down. So somebody that's already familiar with the NFL that's um, advised them on certain outcomes that's taken place. So now they're going back to their old playbook. Yeah. Just a quick update. Ja- Jaguars versus Raiders in the Hall of Fame game just kicked off. Raiders have the ball and looks like Jacksonville just got called for a penalty. Something with a late hit, I'm guessing, watching the replay. So it is first and 10 for the Raiders, trying to see what yard line they're on. I wonder Give if the me. starters are going to play. Uh, doesn't even – looks like they're on about the 30-yard line of the Jaguars. So, mm. Oh, wow. And they get a big run, and it's first down Las Vegas. I believe that way. Yep, it was Josh Jacobs. You got to do it like Vince Scully would do it, man. You got to have <laughs> put some flair into it. Man. <laughs> what? You also, to- from what I heard in NFL news today, uh, and I don't know can you if you can fact check me on this, I heard that Marquise Hollywood Brown, new Cardinals receiver, was arrested for speeding on a highway. What? I did hear about this. I will wow. double check on that. Um, it's, that's crazy. It's like speed, you know? but I wonder if the league going to suspend them for two games. Like you know, it's like you said, Josh. Which is my consistency with these man? I would, man, I would I, like some consistency as well. Yes, yeah, speed yeah. and it's like, uh, all right, you know, whatever. Um, not I'll, just I'll speeding. Watch words. It was actually criminal speeding. Oh, oh so he must have been going like 150 or something. Like dr- yeah. Oh, yeah. he's bugging in. Yeah, he's bugging out. He could have <laughs> kicked it. Yeah, he's tripping. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> he was pulled over after while driving one t- 126 in a 65 mile per hour uh, zone. <laughs> <laughs> What are you doing driving 126 in oh, yeah. a 65 mile per hour zone? Showing off? Showing it's off your fancy 100 or car, fancy sports car that can get up to 126? The only reason you should be, well, I'm not even going to say, I'm not even justifying speeding that fast, but like, was you late for work or was your wife going into labor? Like, I, I think it's a lot of questions that that, that should be posed, but. Yeah, I, I doubt agree. We can find an answer for it. Yep. <laughs> I was just making a justification based on like you're rich and you probably have a fancy sports car. What is the first thing you're gonna want to do with it? Have a driver. <laughs> that. <laughs> I would do. I'll um, agree to that. Yeah. I I would never drive. But, uh, yeah. No. Yeah. If you're if you're rich and famous, just 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 hire someone. Yeah, this this is poor decision making. You know, and the more that we talk about this, is like the more I see the league probably giving him a game or two because it's like, what's the point of why are you going that fast? Like, there's no reason to go 120. No, there's no circumstance to go 120 miles an hour unless you're trying to flex on someone and show I got an Aston Martin. Look how fast I can go. Like, yeah. Right. Quick update, Raiders drive stalled out, but they kicked the 32-yard field goal. They now lead the Jaguars three to nothing. Ah. Was was the starters playing? No, Jared Stidham is playing quarterback. Oh, man. Yeah, this is a pointless game. (laughs) Hey, but at least least we know that the season starts and preseason for everyone else, what, kicks off next weekend? Yeah, speaking of which, 
Um, the Browns' first preseason game is next Friday, August 12th, in Jacksonville against the Jaguars. So, let me ask you this. What do you expect... What do you expect to see from the Browns in their preseason opener six days from now? Or, yeah, six di- No, I'm sorry. Eight days from now against the Jaguars. It's the Jaguars. I expect us to at least walk away with a win. Hmm. It's preseason. To me, it doesn't matter. It's just more of a dress rehearsal. But uh, things that do matter, like, okay, we've been talking about the suspension for – quite a while. Is Deshaun Watson going to play? In his, is he allowed to play in preseason games? I believe and if, so. And if yeah, he I, is, I heard he was. Would, play would you play um, Brissette? Like, that, those parts or those moving pieces is like what I want to figure out, but I wouldn't expect like um, our starters to play probably more than two snaps, I'm thinking. I mean, two series. Yeah, I wouldn't think more than two series, but I would think Deshaun Watson would probably get reps in the first couple games of the preseason. But then in the – or wait. No, there's only three preseason games. I'm sorry. I forgot that they chopped in the fourth preseason game off or whatever it was. So Uh, I always wondered why they did that. It's because they wanted to add the extra game to the season. Oh, that's right. That's why, that's why we're playing the Commanders this season. They're cash grab. They're our extra game. It's a cash grab, man. It's like, which here we go again, talking about how the league is just so inconsistent and so two sided. It's like, hey, we care about pay, player safety. We don't want to want to get hurt, especially in the preseason game. But you know what? Let's add an extra game so they can play a little bit harder and. Have a little bit more carnage on the field. Like, come on, man. Yeah. Um, so, the Cincinnati Bengals, we mentioned earlier, they were in the Super Bowl last year. If their offensive line had held up, Joe Burrow had Jamar Chase wide open for the game winning touchdown. But we all know that didn't end up happening. But I guess because they made the Super Bowl last year, the Bengals are like, you know what? We're going to make renovations to our stadium. So they are, they might be, Paul Brown Stadium, stadium might be going in under, under, might be undergoing a renovation for $493 million. Wow. Yeah, a, but you know what? That's, a, that's about right. Um, Anytime you have a, a marquee quarterback and it's usually these these changes to the stadium, whether it's the practice facility, which I know that they actually get, finally have, I think, are getting the indoor practice facility. Um, and then they got to make the renovations to this Paul Brown Stadium. But this is all coming from Joe Burrow. And I'm sure he probably mentioned it. Hey, man, what the hell, man? Like, do it, Can we get with the times? And then the, <laughs> the Browns was like, okay, yeah, we probably could make a little alteration to it. So, yeah. Looks like Trevor Lawrence is actually playing. He probably needs to play. He probably, I would think he's going to play probably the first quarter. Unless I'm first mis- quarter, f- a few series. Unless I'm mistaken. Yeah. yeah, it's different for the Jaguars, though. Yeah, I mean they're yeah. back-to-back first overall pick champs. Yeah, and they got the one running back that they had last year from Clemson. You know, he was gone for the whole season. I would expect him yeah. probably he's to be not playing. At- He's not playing tonight, actually. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. There were just... a lot of there were a lot of before the season running back injuries last year because you had the Ravens. Their entire running back, their entire like run game went down in like what the span of a week or two. Yeah, and I had a few of them for fantasy football. I was like, I lost two of them boys. <laughs> I. Trevor the Lawrence injury to J.K. Dobbins. Oh. He's going to be a beast this year. Yeah. J- J- J.K. or Trevor Lawrence? J.K. Oh, I see. As an Ohio State fan, I love J.K. Dobbins. But as a Browns fan, I'm supposed to hate him because he plays for a division rival. Yeah, real is real, though. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely diehard Browns, but 
JK, he, he he's gonna give us some oh, more, yeah. more to handle. So oh yeah. yeah. But I actually think he'll be the better running back from Ohio State than Zeke. This year, probably, yeah. 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 By the way, that. Trevor Lawrence is not playing. I stand corrected. It is I I don't know his first name, but Luton is the Jaguars quarterback. What's the oh. last name? L U T O N. Luton. Uh, Will I, I wanna say his name is Will Luton. I'm not 100% sure about that one. I think he played in XFL, though, I think. I want to actually agree with you on that, because there were a lot of guys that came over from the XFL, like P.J. Walker uh, uh, from the Panthers. Something like that. The preseason don't matter anyway, so (laughs) it's just just let us know that the season is close, man, for real. Yep, and it kind of like lets – Oh, or let's the uh, owners in the front office make a decision on like, okay, this guy isn't working out so well, so let's cut him so that we can get our 53-man roster. Right. Mm-hmm. Roster and, adjustments. And we know the Super yes. Bowl this year is going to be in Arizona at State Farm Stadium. I don't expect the Cardinals to make it three straight teams to play in their home stadium for the Super Bowl. Because, sorry, Arizona, but you're just not good enough to make the Super Bowl. But anyway, so Super Bowl 57 is going to be at State Farm, as we just said. Super Bowl 58 will be at Allegiant Stadium, where the Raiders play. They could be keep that trend going of, of uh, host teams playing in their own stadium. Super Bowl 59 is going to be at Caesars Superdome. I'm so used to calling it the Mercedes-Benz. Superdome, but no. And that is New Orleans, right? Yes. We don't right. know th- we don't know the location for Super Bowl 60 as of now. So, let me ask you this. What do you think it would take for the NFL to say, "You know what? We're going to bring the Super Bowl to Cleveland, Ohio." A dome? Uh, a dome maybe <laughs> I don't know cuz like <laughs> do we have a do we have a big enough stadium to fit like a Super Bowl level crowd? I mean, if we had a roof on over First Energy, you do because that tells what seventy seventy five thousand. But they the Super Bowl is not going to be played anywhere that doesn't have a roof or it's not in a wet a warm. Right. Space, I mean, you know? well, other than remember- Super Bowl forty eight at uh, MetLife in New York. Yeah. Right. 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 And that was. Different circumstances because it was in New York, but or, yeah. Other than that, sorry, New Jersey, New uh, Jersey. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely. Unless we get a dome, get about a trillion dollar stimulus package to clean up downtown and um, get crime out the way, I absolutely doubt it'll be here. So I just looked up the seating capacity of First Energy Stadium. It says 67,895. So about 70,000. So you were close enough. Just about, yeah. Yeah, you were close enough. I just wanted to... That boy to... will fact check you on a, off the rip. Yes. <laughs> hey. Hey. You're the noob. So you know we're going to... We told you in the dry run. We're going to challenge sure. you. We're going to sure. fact check yeah. you. Yeah. So, so um, come with accuracy. <laughs> now, if if you were to if we were to get a cold Super Bowl, I think the best stadium to do it would be the winners of the would be the stadium of the original Super Bowl champions over in Lambeau Field in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Oh, a, a Super Bowl in the, on the frozen tundra. Good yeah. God. That'd be good to look at, but uh, you know, I I think ever since then the league said it's too cold and it's too uncomfortable for the fans. I doubt that it will ever ever happen again. But it's absolutely a beauty to watch on TV for sure. That would oh, be, yeah. How about this one? Bring the Super Bowl to Buffalo, New York, and have it be at the Bill Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> now they might mess around, keep the train going, and play be playing in their own stadium. So I can see that. <laughs> the, the the Bills, the Bills, and the Packers would be definitely teams to play in their own stadiums. If the Packers can, uh, you know, 
give Aaron Rodgers some wide receiver help? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of weird. All I'm seeing on your screen right now is just like a silhouette of you. Yeah, no, I don't know what's going on that I'm so yeah. dark. <laughs> yeah, it's like if you on a, on the news and you just want your face to be blacked out. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm in witness protection. <laughs> With his protection program, because <laughs> like I have that light on behind me, I think it's, I think that light. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. At first, I didn't want to say anything, but it became so like stand out let, to me. Let me go turn another C-ball. light on and see if it's better. <laughs> see, boss, his name has been changed to protect his his self, his safety. <laughs> yes, he he's now a, a part of witness protection. <laughs> okay, I just turned another light on. Right, oh, <laughs> oh wow, you actually exist. <laughs> yeah, no, I have multiple. Cause like the bulb that's closest to my to my where I'm sitting burned out a week ago, and I don't have another. Re- I don't have a replacement bulb. I have to put that on my list of things to do. Get more light bulbs. <laughs> we should be prepared for next week, dude, because I know we're going to have yeah. a lot of stuff to discuss come next week. So Yes, we will. Oh, but, yeah. hey, but, hey, we're not done with this week's show. We're still going because um, we got NBA stuff to talk about. First of all, um, shout out to Brittany Griner because she needs to come home because this is getting ridiculous with her and Russia and all that. Again, we don't normally bring up politics, but I will slam on the damn table. Brit- bring Brittany Griner home. Absolutely. Absolutely. I originally heard something about we were sending a prisoner exchange to Russia for her, but now she's going to be in jail for the next nine and a half years in Russia. I yeah. I don't know what's going on with all that, but it, it needs to be solved, and it needs to be solved soon. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it said, I'm looking this up. It says she was sentenced to nine years in Russian jail. <sighs> That's wild. Yeah. That's wild, and it's like, yeah, hopefully um, powers that be figure this out, get her home, get her back on U.S. soil, and um, you could turn the page on this, but... Yeah, this is definitely unfortunate what's going on out there in Russia. Yeah. yeah. As, as a WNBA fan myself, um, it's weird not seeing Brittany Griner play for the Phoenix Mercury right now. It, it doesn't feel right. You're just mm-hmm. like, that doesn't feel like the Phoenix Mercury. I know. Like, it's Diana Taurasi. It's Brittany Griner. That's how you know the Phoenix Mercury. Yeah. Love to see yeah. come home soon, man. Love she comes okay. home soon. Yep. Um, and in other uh, WNBA news, it was announced that the schedule for the league is getting expanded to 40 games. Hmm. What was it before? Uh, I am not sure about that. But anyway, that just means more games for these girls to show what they can do. Yeah. Oh, well, hopefully they keep expanding and um, you know, showing showing um growth each single season, man. But still got quite a ways to go to catch up to the NBA. That's true. Hey, uh, let's get let's get a team in Cleveland. Hey, we used to. I think they were called the Cleveland Rockers, if I remember correctly. The show was, yeah, Cleveland Rockers. And I'm not sure. I didn't even know we had lost them until, like, a couple of seasons. And I'm like, damn, what happened to the Rockers? I thought we had a team. Like, nah, they've been gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, speaking of schedules, since it's the month of August, this is usually the month when the NBA schedule comes out. So let me ask you this. We know the Warriors are going to start the season at home, you know, for their banner raising night and their ring, their ring ceremony. So, who do you think will be the opponent for the Warriors on banner raising night? I personally, because of how good that playoff series was, I would like it to be Memphis. 
that would be cool. Um, I'm, I would be with the Memphis choice. Uh, I'll probably do see they're probably using the Lakers, especially with it being a West Coast team. It's probably going to be probably either the Lakers or uh, potentially the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves. So. Ah, uh, the T-Wolves. I could see it being the Clippers, possibly, if Paul George and Kawhi yeah. are both healthy. Absolutely. Oh, what a coincidence. I'm wearing my Kawhi Leonard shirt. <laughs> Gosh, I wonder why I mentioned the damn Clippers then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so now, yeah, yeah. So... What ca- like we again? We don't know the schedule, obviously, but are there certain opponents that you're like for the Cavs, where you're like, I'm immediately circling this game. For me, it's every game against Philadelphia. I am circling that those games, whether it's three games or four, I am immediately circling them. I have my eyes on Chicago, Boston, and Miami. Okay. Yeah, I'd probably say Boston, Miami, Milwaukee, like all, all of the top tier teams. Uh, you definitely want to see how they stack up against the best. Of like the, best. the heavy hitters in the East. Absolutely. And we yeah. saw that last season in uh, the game, Josh, that we went to against Atlanta. You know, Atlanta was coming fresh off an Eastern Conference Finals run. And I was like. I want to see how the Cavs stack up against a team that just made the Eastern Conference Finals. And we won that game. That was our first win last season. Yes, it was. Um, we also went to the game against Chicago where I know the Bulls were depleted, but we still won that game fairly easily. Yeah, I mean, they had – they. I, I mean, they still had Lonzo and Levine. It was just DeMar was out. Yeah. I mean, Which sucked because I really wanted to see DeMar DeRozan. Ultimately, no. we lost the season series against Chicago, three to one. So yeah, I'm Chicago definitely- seemed to have the upper edge on this man, and um, you know, I got me personally. I have to I have a meeting that I have to attend to, so uh, I thought we was gonna go be on for an hour today, uh, but I do apologize in advance, guys. Uh, but uh, I do need to get to my meeting, uh, but. This has been absolutely a uh, great talk. All right. Well, yeah. thanks, for, thanks for joining in, Jay. Chris and mm-hmm. I will hold down the fort for you. All right, buddy. You. Yes. I'm going to try uh, to tune in. I'm going to tune in. Okay. Good luck with your meeting. Yep, All right, Chris, thanks, and I will, Chris and I will hold down the fort for you, dude. Yeah, no problem. Appreciate it. No problem, y'all. Peace. Yep. All right. Peace out. So. All right. So, so it's just you and me. So. You know right where we're going now that it's just you and me, right? Now that we're continuing our coverage of the NBA and our countdown to the NBA tip-off, I'd like to do something special since we're both Cavs fans here and we're doing the countdown to tip-off. Why don't we count down our top 10 Cavaliers of all time? Oh, good God. Are we doing 10 to 1, 5 to 1, what? 10, 10 to 1. Top 10 Cavaliers of all time. Oh, good God. 10 to 1. And I will I will put it out there that I want to base this off of personal, like, personal achievement for the player. Not just how they played as the Cavs. It's just, oh, this player is a great player, and they played for the Cavs. Yeah. By the way, it is now six to nothing Raiders, so they can another field goal. Field goal. Yes, that's good. Wh- Whoop de do. <laughs> um, all right. Anyway. So, all right. Starting well, off I my think, list, oh, you go ahead. I think we both know who's going to be number one for, on both of our lists. So let's get yeah. out of the way. Let's just get it out of the way right now. LeBron James. Le- is LeBron James. One. There's nobody better. Then LeBron ever, like, not even in a Cavaliers uniform, just all time. Actually, I have Michael Jordan number one. Well, yeah. I mean, like, I, him and LeBron, in my opinion, are 1A and 1B. Yeah, they're interchangeable. But anyway, back, back to the original discussion. Um, 
I know we were going 10 to 1, but I'll just give you my number two. I want to put Kyrie there, but because of how he left the Cavaliers and all that, I'm putting Kevin Love number two. I'm putting I'm putting Mark Price at my number two. The greatest point guard in Cavaliers history has all the numbers to put it by. Steve Kerr himself said that the prototype for Stephen Curry was Mark Price. So I guess we're going one to ten now. Oh well. <laughs> eh, it's fine. But all right. So I do have Mark Price number three. So I have. Uh, because of his individual statistics and his individual performances outside of his time with the Cavaliers, he was a Cavalier at, for one season. Shaq. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, number four, I am going to go Austin Carr. Number four for me is the man many people confused with Wilt Chamberlain, Walt Frazier. I forgot he played for. Wait, did he play for the Cavs? Yep, he was part of the. Um, he was part of the Miracle at Richfield. Really? He oh. was on that. He was on that team. Okay. Um, let's see. Number five. I'm going with the Z. The Jernis Elgaskis. I'm putting Z at my number five as well. Okay. Um, number six. I think that's where I'll put Kyrie. My number six is Mark Price's number one teammate, Brad Doherty. Oh, all right. Um, shoot. Fine. I'll do Brad Doherty seven. My number seven is Larry Nance Sr. Okay. Number eight. This is just because I was a huge fan of him when I was little. Larry Hughes. <laughs> I love I love Larry Hughes. <laughs> uh, my number eight is Kyrie Irving. Okay. Let's see. Number nine. Um. Ooh, here's one. He he made a ton, two huge three pointers in Game Six of the 2007 Eastern Conference Finals. You know who I'm talking about? Eric Snow. No. No, wait. No, not Eric Snow. Uh, was it Gibson? Correct. Booby Gibson. My number nine is Kevin Love. Okay. I think he deserves to be on that on that on that spot. Yes, I agree. <laughs> um, number ten. Ooh. I think I'm going to go Jim Jones on that one. My number 10 is John Hot Rod Williams. Okay. So, pretty good list. Yeah. I, I would say the only oddball on that one would be with me going with Larry Hughes on that one. <laughs> but whatever. Yeah. I was also going to put Sean Kemp on that, on that list. But, like, does anyone remember that he played for the Cavs? I think everybody remembers him playing in Seattle. So Yeah. And, I, yeah. I mean, I did put Shaq on the list. But Sha Shaq is you, – you can't, you can't have a list of a top ten for any team that Shaq played for and not have him at least somewhere on that list. Hey, speaking of Shaq, did you know he actually – was it part of a mixed tag team match? On AEW. Really? When was this? It was during the pandemic era. He, right. he teamed up with Red... Or, I'm sorry. He teamed up with Jade Cargill, the current TBS champion, to face Cody Rhodes and Red Velvet. Interesting. I did not know about that. Yep. Um, Cody Rhodes put him through a table. And then, later in the... So then he got put into an ambulance, and then later in, later in the night or something, they cut back to the ambulance, and Shaq just disappeared. But <laughs> we haven't gotten any, we never got any type of payoff to that story. 
It just, he just vanished. Interesting. Yeah. And Jacksonville just missed the field goal, so it remained six to nothing. Well, yeah. you know that kicker's not making it, making it <laughs> past, making it, making the fifty-three man roster. Right. But hey, going to AEW, we have our first match for the All Out pay per view. Eddie Kingston challenged Sammy Guevara to a match at All Out. Ooh, I actually like that idea. Yeah. I'm so guessing it's because Guevara is part of the Jericho Appreciation Society and Eddie Kingston hates any anyone even remotely affiliated with J- Chris Jericho. Something like that. But it seems like we're done with the Eddie Kingston-Jericho feud, which is unfortunate because... They're I, tied one and one. Well, uh, t- technically tied one and one in singles matches... Technically, it's 2-1 Jericho because of the anarchy in the arena. Yeah, but what about pulling guts? Oh, yeah. Kingston's team won that. So we would be 2-2 then. Yeah. Oh, jeez. So here's what I would have done for the all-out pay-per-view. I've told you about this match before. A steel cage match. Jericho versus Kingston. If there's any interference from either side, the opponent gets the other person gets the win. So, for example, if anybody from the Jericho Appreciation Society were to come down to the ring and try and interfere in any way, Eddie Kingston gets the win automatically. Whereas if anybody associated with Eddie Kingston the Black Cool Combat Club, or Santana, Ortiz, Ruby Soho, anybody. If anybody comes down to the ring to interfere, then Jericho gets the win. Do, 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 do the, what I want to know is, does the Jericho Appreciation Society and all of Eddie Kingston's voice, do they know about this stipulation, or is this a ploy to get them to try and interfere? They know about the stipulation. Okay. Because, like, if they didn't know about the stipulation and tried to interfere, that would be kind of an unfair ending. Correct. So, yes, they they, they would know about the stipulation. So, under with that hypothetical match, who do you think would win? I'm going to give it to Jericho. He... He's going to put the... He's going to take... He's going to take Eddie Kingston down... With the code breaker and submit him with the walls. Okay. Um, being that Kingston submitted him with the stretch plum, which is one of the best submissions I have ever seen. I mean, you saw it. He literally. Yeah. Like, I don't even know how to describe that submission. It was like. He had his head trap. He had Jericho's head trapped between his leg, and he was just wrenching back on Jericho's arm. That's yeah, he had one arm, one of Jericho's arms behind him, and the other one sort of like, sort of like in front of Jericho, but like had a hand on it so he couldn't like grab his other arm. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you know what? We're gonna forget about all the clues I've given you. Um, well, just say, I'm not going to continue to give any more clues, but I'm still not going to say. All I'm going to say is there is an event happening on August 24th. You will find out closer to the day of the show, of the event, what said event is. That's it. Yes. Correct. But anyway, so next week we are getting what they are calling Quake by the Lake. It is a TV special at Target Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we are getting the main event, or presumably the main event, will be for the interim world title, Jericho versus Moxley. I'm I'm really excited for that one. And we just got a, we had a second a match announced, what was it, yesterday or today? 
which is Brody King versus Darby Allen in a coffins match. In a coffin match, correct. The only way to win that match is to get your opponent in the coffin and close the lid. That's the yep. only way to win it. Actually, we had a we had a similar match on last night's Dynamite, but instead of coffins, it was a dumpster match. It was the acclaimed Max Caster and uh, Anthony and, Bowens. Yes, which if you haven't seen it, we actually interviewed Max Caster the last time AEW was in Cleveland. We have it on the that was for Beach Break. That was uh, back when he was a heel, actually. He, he turned face. And as he turned face, the AEW music channel finally uploaded the acclaimed entrance theme. Oh, and, uh, it was hilarious. During, Vince, or during Max Caster's rap yesterday, he actually referenced Vince McMahon retiring. Yeah, I heard about that. And I heard John Cena was also kind of talking about it. Touchdown like, Raiders! Yeah! Woo! <laughs> there you go. Touchdown. The first touchdown of a new NFL season. Is that the pizzazz you and Jason were looking for? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Touchdown Raiders! The Raiders! The Raiders. <laughs> it's time for Raider football. <laughs> Looks like it was. Amir I don't know why I went southern there. <laughs> Looks like it was Amir Abdullah. Anyway, so getting back to all elite wrestling. So yeah, with the dumpster match, it was you had to get since it was a tag team match. You had to get your the opposing. Both members of the opposing team into the dumpster and close the lid. Who won that match? Caster and Bowens. Okay. Yep. We also had the undisputed elite return. So that's Kyle O'Reilly, Bobby Fish, and uh, Adam Cole, Bebe, along with Matt Jackson or, and Nick Jackson. Or at least it used to include Matt Jackson and Nick Jackson. Because Adam Cole said, while I'm not, while me and Kyle O'Reilly are not medically cleared, he was talking about the trios uh, tournament that AEW is doing. You, didn't, you guys didn't choose Bobby Fish to be your third partner. So you guys aren't allowed to compete in the trios tournament tournament and they turned on the bucks now uh bobby fish and kyle Riley, that's red dragon isn't it correct that's their tag name yes but who came out to make the save cowboy shit cowboy shit cowboy shit hangman adam page correct from what i heard before he joined aew he was a high school english teacher I cannot confirm that. So that is something I will I just I saw it on in the comment section of the YouTube video of his uh entrance music. Mm. But uh so it seems like the Bucks and Hangman are getting back together. So if that is indeed the case, what does that mean for when Kenny Omega comes back? Cuz before he left um, he was associated with the Young Bucks, and they had a whole thing because they were the elite. It, oh, that is going to cost some good. I mean, but Kenny, wait, Kenny Omega and Hangman and Page had some, have something with each other because Hangman and Page was the guy who took the AEW Men's World Championship off of Kenny Omega. That is correct. But get this, at one point, Kenny Omega and Hangman were actually a tag team. And they were tag team champions. Really? Huh. So, yeah, it did not, it did not immediately start bad. Like, it just 
devolved over time. And wasn't at one point Hangman and Page involved with the Dark Order too? Yes. But that seems to be over. Okay. Makes so, a lot of sense. We'll see what happens with that. But, uh, yeah, I'm very excited for All Out. I agree. So, who do you think? Who do you think is uh, if Swerving or Glory is still tag team champions by All Out? Who do you think is going to face them to take the belts off of them? I, I really don't know, because they're having like a street fight or something against Tony Nese and Josh Woods on Rampage this Friday. I guess Josh Woods is from Impact Wrestling. But maybe that's the match they do at All Out. But that's not, that doesn't seem like a pay per view worthy match. I have two options for who I think could take the, could take the titles. Well, actually, I'll, 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 I'll three. I have three. One, you go to a former tag champions in the Lucha Bros. Everyone loves them. They're, a fan favorite duo. They deserve a proper run because their first run didn't end the way it should have. Right. The only reason they lost the tag titles to Jurassic Express is because Ray Fanex got injured. So they had to take the titles off of the Lucha Brothers. Another option would be the current Ring of Honor tag champions in FTR. It seems like it seems like Tony Khan's really trying to push FTR and by giving them both the Ring of Honor and AEW tag belts, that could be a proper push. I'm pretty sure Ring of Honor or uh, FTR also has a third set of tag team titles. It might be I have seen it on them, but I'm not 100% sure where it's from or what it is, but Hey, more belts, more pride. I think it might be the Triple A tag team title, something like that. I believe you're correct. And then the third option, if they are truly back together, Jurassic Express. Uh, well, they're not going to do that, that that tag team title match at All Out because you. We're getting Jungle Boy versus Christian right. at All Out. It's just a matter of time before that becomes official. So let me ask you this. With the way the feud and storyline, or feud, nobody says storyline. We'll just go with feud, so who cares? Um, do you think it's just going to be a straight up, straight up match, or do you think it's going to have some type of stipulation on it, like a no DQ match or something like that? If it does get a stipulation, here's the stipulation I want for it to have. Okay. So it'll be, it'll be Jungle Boy versus Christian Cage for custody of Luchasaurus. But in the end, no matter who wins, Luchasaurus chooses Jungle Boy anyways. Because, I mean, that's his buddy. That's his pal. It's just a boy and his dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> you know I what I mean? Yeah, I don't think they're going to do that. I, but with the way the feud is going, I could see them making it like a chairs match or a, or a no DQ match, something like that. Or maybe it's a cage match. That would be funny. Jungle Boy versus Christian Cage inside a steel cage. Yeah. That would be funny. Or maybe they make it a Falls Count Anywhere match. Ooh. You don't see a lot of those anymore. No. Um, if they really want to, I guess they can make it a Last Man Standing match. But I don't know how you would top the Last Man Standing match we just saw at SummerSlam. Where Brock Lesnar literally had a tractor pick up the damn ring. Yeah. But wait, how would you do a singles match in it or a, 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 like a one person versus one person match in a last man standing format? That's what they did with Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar. It's the if you had to keep your opponent down for the 10 count. Oh, OK. Yep. 
So okay. So clearly we're do- getting that match at at uh, All Out. It seems like we're getting Ricky Starks versus Powerhouse Hobbs. In which, single- which everyone thought they were going to be the one to ones to take the titles off of. Um, Swerve in our glory. Swerve in our glory. Yeah. I guess another tag team that you could push to take the tag titles off of Swerve in our glory is Hookhausen, but. It seems like Hook's, that Hook's the FTW champion. Yeah. It seems like Hookhausen is done. They haven't really done anything with that whole thing since. Uh, I mean, Hook came in to, you know, defend Danhausen when Ricky Starks was squashing him. Actually, no. It was that the way that whole segment worked was Ricky Starks squashed Dan Housen. Starks gets back on the microphone and says, you know what? I still got a little bit left in me. So let's do another open challenge. And that's when Hook came out. Okay. Yeah. So it was two separate open challenges. And then, you know, Hook ended up winning the FTW championship. Ricky Starks was in the ring afterwards cutting a babyface promo with Powerhouse Hobbs standing behind him. And at one point, Hobbs just just wrecked him. That's that's what I heard. Yes. So that's how it went down. Yeah. So, by the way, Chris and I are planning on starting our own show. We'll give you the more details about it once we figure it all out. But we do know the name of the show is going to be Step It Up. We're going to be talking NFL football, NBA basketball. We'll be bringing in NHL hockey because that's a topic we love to talk about. We'll be talking AEW. WWE, UFC. Yes. Speaking And of, maybe racing. Yeah, maybe racing. So we'll – But we'll speaking talk. of you as oh, – Yeah, there. sorry. But we'll talk a little bit of baseball here and there. But our primary focus is going to be the NFL, NBA, NHL, and combat sports. We'll just say that. By the way, speaking of UFC, there was a pay-per-view over the weekend. That is correct. And to the surprise of very few, I would suspect, we have a new bantamweight champion. And her name is Amanda Nunes. Yes, uh, it seemed like she felt a lot, you know, it felt a lot more like an old Amanda, Amanda Nunes fight, what we were seeing at 277, than what we saw of her at 269. Right. Uh, when she faced Juliana Pena the first time and lost. Do you think we'll get the, tr- I don't think after that fight, I don't think we're getting the trilogy fight between Amanda New. Amanda Nunes completely outmatched Juliana Pena, strike for strike, exchange for exchange. Juliana Pena, it seemed from what I heard that she could get barely any offense in at all. Yeah, I did not watch that pay-per-view because that was the same night as SummerSlam, which that's the second consecutive time that WWE and A and uh, UFC have done a pay-per-view. Oh, I'm sorry. WWE calls their events premium live events, but screw it. I'm calling them pay-per-views anyway. I don't care. You got to pay to view it. Exactly. So anyway, it was the second consecutive second straight time. WWE and UFC have done pay-per-views on the same night. Although unlike UFC 276 and money in the bank, SummerSlam and UFC 277 were not in the same city. Whereas UFC 276 and Money in the Bank were both in Las Vegas. Yeah. But anyway, getting back to it. Yeah, Nunes completely dominated Juliana Pena at, in the main event of UFC 277. Um, I, I just heard that it was a beatdown. Yeah, it was... Nunez completely outclassed her. Completely outclassed her. It, it wasn't even close. Um, I'll pull up the stats actually right now uh, on the ESPN app. Let's see. Yeah, Nunez won by unanimous decision. 
uh, 50 45, 50 43, and 50 44. Oh, wow. Yeah. Pena actually had more total strikes, 130 to 126. But Nunez had more significant strikes, 85 to 60. Nunez Ooh. had more head strikes, 67 to 54. Nunez had more body strikes, 10 to 6. Nunez had more leg shots, 8 to 0. She had 11 minutes and 49 seconds of control time. Pena had none. Wow. Nunez had six takedowns. Uh, she was six of eight on takedowns. Pena didn't go for any. But they each tried a submission. All right. Uh, what about knockdowns? Uh, doesn't say on here. I'll Let me see if it has more stats on the UFC app. The UFC app usually has uh, knockdowns, which is... Not where you take someone. It's where you throw a strike that knocks your opponent to the ground. Correct. So let's see. Um, No, it doesn't have... Oh, Nunes had three knockdowns. Okay. And Pena, none? None. Oh, okay. Yeah. So in the co-main event, Brandon Moreno defeated Kai Car France, which was also a rematch. Uh, he is now the interim flyweight champion, which means we are getting round four between Davison Figueredo and Brandon Moreno, because basically there's nobody else in the flyweight division. Right now, um, let's see. Uh, Until one of them defeats the other twice in a row, I think they're just going to keep trading the belt. Yeah, because right now... It, their first fight, they had a majority draw, so nobody won that. Their second fight, that was where Moreno submitted Figueredo, correct? That is correct, at UFC 263. Right. And um, then at UFC 270, it was, I believe, a split decision in fit in favor of Figueredo. Correct. So they are 1-1-1, one, one, and one, if I am doing that correctly. Yes, that is correct. Uh, draws is the third one. You don't put a no contest, or you just put a no contest off to the side. So it would say 1-1-0, one, one, and then 1-N-C or 2-N-C, depending on no contests. Right. So they're so essentially, they're tied 1-1. One to one. Yeah. When, it, when you boil it down. So whoever wins this fourth fight is going to have the 2-1 to one advantage. But yep. I, I could see them doing around five. They're going to keep doing it until someone beats someone twice. Say Figueredo wins this fight against Moreno. Okay. And they'll, they might do around five. If Figueredo wins that, then no need for a sixth round. Figueredo has the advantage. But if Moreno wins either round, then you, I guess you can keep going until someone beats someone twice in a row. I mean, you have to put a pin in it, pin in this whole series at some point. They can't just keep going till it's like Figueredo Moreno twenty or whatever. They're not going to do that. I don't think they will. But at the same time, is there anyone in the flyweight division that? Could even pose a threat to either of them. I don't know, but that's that. That's the reality of the flyweight division. Is that even even like before the whole Figueroa Moreno saga? Uh, let's see. You had Demetrius Johnson who had a UFC record eleven defenses. No yeah. one was standing in his way, and then after that, he got, he got beat by Cejudo. Um, and the only reason Cejudo lost the championship is because he moved up to bantamweight, became bantamweight champion, so he vacated the flyweight belt. Did he? Did he lose the bantamweight belt legit, or was it? Uh, or did he vacate it? He vacated it because he retired. Okay. Although he he might be coming back, and it sounds like if he does, he wants to challenge. Volk. 
that, I, as funny as that fight may seem, we all know Volkanovsky is just going to murder him. Okay. So, the, pay, the main event for UFC 276 was Adesanya Cannoneer. Yep. The main event for 277 was Pena Nunes 2. The main event Na- for... Paper 278 is Usman versus Edwards 2. Correct. 279 is Hamzat Shemaev against Nate Diaz. The main yep. event for U- UFC 280 is Olvera versus Mak- I have Makashev. Seen- yes. And I don't care what the UFC says. I know it says it's for the vacant for the vacant lightweight belt. No, it that is Oliveira defending his belt. Damn it! He shouldn't like. It was a half a pound, Dana. You can't strip a man over a half a pound. You I didn't strip know. GSP when he was decimals over the weight against his Nick for his Nick Diaz fight. I don't know if it was Dana White actually who stripped him. I think it might have been the Arizona. Uh, Sports Commission. Oh, yeah. You know, the last state to be able to recognize combat sports. Yeah. But that Uh, leaves UFC 281, which is going to be at Madison Square Garden. Um, We only have one confirmed fight for that, and that is Dustin Poirier versus Michael Chandler. Oh, that fight got confirmed. Well, the fight's confirmed. I well, I thought it was. I thought it was like we already know the fight's going to happen. I could have sworn it was um at the MSG pay per view. Huh. Um. Oh yeah. Um. As of twenty twenty one hours ago, on a website called America. Um. It says it's close to signing for UFC 281. I'm seeing another one from MMA Fighting four hours ago saying Poirier opens as a favorite over Chandler. And I'm seeing other articles saying that Chandler versus Poirier is being targeted for UFC 281. I so, mean, with no other fights in that and that pay-per-view happening in three months, like... I kind of feel like it has to go on that card now. Yeah, that has to be. I would think that has to be the main event. But unless unless they pull a title fight from somewhere, like just a random like, I don't know, give Volkanovski a third defense this year, which he I don't think he needs Um, because he literally just fought Holloway last month. Correct. I mean, I don't think Usman, even if Usman wins in dominant fashion against Leon Edwards at 278, which I don't think is going to happen, I think that would be too quick quick of a turnaround for him. Like, the only champions that aren't, like, currently booked are Valentina Shevchenko. Francis Ngannou. Francis Ngannou. Yuri Prohaska. And Yuri Prohaska. I think... If they do a title fight at MSG, it's going to be Yuri Prohaska. Against He's the, Jan Blahovich? You can put him against Jan Blahovich. You can put him against... Um, do you do the Glover rematch? I don't think you do the Glover rematch that quickly. I would like to see Yuri Prohaska versus Glover Teixeira. I, or not Glover Teixeira. Um... Jan Blahovich. Is that big enough of a draw for a pay-per-view at Madison Square Garden, though? I wouldn't know for sure, but I mean, if Jan Blahovich versus Glover Teixeira was a big enough draw for an Abu Dhabi pay-per-view, which it was at 267. But it was free. It was a free pay-per-view, yes, but it wasn't free for the people who had to get into the arena. Correct, but I don't think 
Yuri Prohaska versus Jan Blachowicz is big enough. Doesn't have enough star power on either side for Madison Square Garden. The that world. is true. Right. Although, what you could do, I don't know if it would be too quick of a turnaround, but maybe this is where you pull the trigger on Figueredo versus Moreno 4? I, see, I don't know if that has enough star power. That's the problem. Like, I, uh, That's the problem with today's UFC is there's not enough champions with enough star power. Right. Like, like the biggest, the biggest ones are Nunez, who just fought, Usman, who's about to fight. Um, it, Adesanya, but his last Adesanya, couple, but his, his last like three fights, his last boring. four fight, yeah, his last three title defenses have been extremely boring. Like you'd have to go back to twenty twenty one to UFC two fifty three. Against um, Costa, Paulo Costa for like his most exciting defense when he dismantled him in two rounds. Right, actually, um, for those of you still watching us, which we appreciate you sticking with us, we have no idea how long we're gonna go because Chris and I can talk our freaking heads off about this type of stuff, as you can see. But yes, that, <laughs> UFC 253 was actually our first pay per view together. He that is never, correct. He had never watched UFC with me before. That is correct. The last time I'd seen a UFC pay-per-view was when Stipe won his first championship in 2016. At, I believe it was UFC 198. That is correct. Yeah, in Brazil. Against Fabrizio Verdum. Yep. And I don't care. what I know I'm out on an island on this one. But in my opinion, Stipe brought home the first official championship for the city of Cleveland in 2016. I will stand by that statement. I'm standing by him on that one. I agree. Just because it's an individual championship does not lose its merit that it still is involved with the Cleveland championship. I mean, he was at the parade. He was there. Correct. And here's the other thing, too. I get it. Stipe is the one fighting in the octagon. It's just a one-on-one -on -one thing. It was him against Fabrizio Verdum. But when you watch UFC, when at the end of each round, where does he go back to? He goes back to his corner, and he has coaches all around him. He has his Muay Thai coach, his Jiu-Jitsu coach. Um, his, his striking coach. Yes. I'm sure he has a wrestling coach. So while it's just Steve Bay fighting in the octagon, he has a whole team. So by that, you could, couldn't you, to a certain extent, call UFC a team sport? Yes, I believe you can. And I definitely will. I mean, you know. In, within the UFC, I'm not going to go around saying UFC is a team sport when I'm like on UFC Facebook groups because people will, will just laugh at me and be like, you have no idea what you're talking about. But, right. You know, bah humbug to them. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to touch on something that uh, I just found out today for Formula One news for all my Formula One fans out there. Go ahead. Sebastian Vettel has announced his retirement and Aston Martin announced that the person taking his seat will be Fernando Alonso, who currently races for Alpine. The only problem is Alpine didn't know about this. Oh, for and, like Fernando Alonso has been with a ton of teams. Like I remember. Oh yeah. He Ferrari. Did, yeah. He raced with Ferrari he raced with, oh, I'm trying to remember what team he raced for when I was little. It was like some bright, some team that had like bright blue and yellow as their team colors. I'm oh, trying, God, I don't even know that one. <laughs> I, I might have their hat somewhere in my hat collection. I'd have to I would have said Williams, but back in like the early, like 
late 90s, early 2000s, Williams colors were just pure white and navy blue. They're, it's not like the flashy light blue that Williams uses nowadays. It was just a white with just like a mute navy. I'm seeing if I can look this up. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, I see it. I see what car, the car it was. Um, it was, oh, it was, I guess it, whatever team it was, they got a new name. Um, da, da, da. oh, it was Renault. Ah, uh, yes, Formula Renault. Yes. Um, uh, and as for what Alpine is doing about this situation, they were looking to call up some kid, I don't remember the name, from Formula 2. The only problem is they're not the only one with their hands on this talent. Mm. Uh, Who else? Our old f er, uh, McLaren. Oh, so Lewis Hamilton. No, that's Mercedes. Oh, okay. Uh, McLaren is the same owners who own McLaren's F1 team also own the Aero McLaren IndyCar team. Mm. So it's kind of like Alpine wants this guy, but McLaren wants this. McLaren wants the same guy. And the guy put out a statement saying that he already signed with McLaren or he signed with Alpine in 2023, or no, not 2023, 2024. So, what does Alpine do? Do they call him up a year early, or do they risk, or do they risk losing him to McLaren and keep that 2024? Isn't there a similar situation happening in IndyCar? Ah, yes, you're talking about the situation regarding 2021 series champ Alex Pillow. Correct. And there's, on top of this, there's also a situation happening with it in NASCAR with uh, Tyler Reddick announcing that in 2024, he's joining 23XI Racing, which is owned in, or co-owned by Denny Hamlin and Michael Jordan. Only problem is he didn't let RCR know about that. Oh, good God. So, <laughs> so exactly. basically three drivers are going to three different places and leaving their current rides in the dark until they find out about it on Twitter. So basically to summarize, it's three shit shows. Pretty much. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Um, what What's our next Formula One race? Um, currently, they are on summer break. I believe the next one is... It starts with a B. Bulgaria? Belgium? No. Maybe, yeah, Bel the Belgian Grand Prix. Okay. Um, that, I believe, is next week. IndyCar's next race is August 7th. It's the Grand Prix of Nashville. And I do not know for the life of me what NASCAR's grand race was, or next race was. They were just at Indianapolis for the, uh, I guess it's now called the Indy 250 or whatever, because they turned the oval course into a road course. It The next race for IndyCar, or I'm sorry, NASCAR, is... Michigan. Okay, so it's August, Michigan weekend. Correct, August seventh, and okay, uh, yes. As for Formula One, or did you already say that one? Yes, it's the Belgian Grand Prix. Um, yes, it is the Rolex Belgian Gum Grand Prix, but that won't be happening until the end of August, August twenty sixth. Yes, because August they. 28th. Because they are on summer break, uh, according to um, according to a official sources for the F one. Got so drivers are taking this time to visit their homes, you know, 
uh, go on vacation. I've heard some people are like, I heard Lewis Hamilton's on a yacht somewhere. I, wow. Um, looks like Verstappen's in first place in the driver's standings. Um, he just he just won the championship last year, didn't he? I believe so. I yeah. I will double check with my dad about that one because he's a huge racing fan himself, specifically yep. Formula One. Um, I think it's Leclerc in second place. Ah, Charles Leclerc. Yeah. Um, looks like it's Perez in third, and Sergio Perez. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure who that is in fourth. R-U-S? R-U-S. That's a Russian driver, I believe. No. Oh. Uh, uh, are you talking about George Russell? I believe so. Um, fifth place, Spanish driver, S-A-I. Ooh. Ah, I believe that is Carlos Sainz. That sounds right. Sainz, yeah. And then seventh is... I believe that's Daniel Norris. Uh, yes, I would believe so. And then that's your top seven because I – where is Lewis Hamilton? Good God. I don't even see Lewis Hamilton in the top 20. His thing would be H-A-M. Yeah, let's see. Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. I completely skipped over him. Lewis Hamilton is sixth. Okay. I my fault on that one. Sorry, Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, man. In terms of the constructor standings, Red Bull is in first. Yeah. Fer- Ferrari is second. Mercedes is third. Alpine is fourth. That's just about the top four I'd expect. McLaren is fifth. Alpha yeah, Ro- there. Alpha Rom- Alpha Romeo is sixth. Haas is seventh. Really? Alpha Tari is eighth. Aston Martin ninth, and Williams is tenth. Dang, I'm I'm a huge Williams fan, so seeing them in tenth kind of it's kind of rough. <laughs> so we got about two minutes to go in the first half of the Hall of Fame game. Raiders have the ball on looks to be about. The 26-yard line right now, third and seven. Passes complete. First down, Raiders. What is the score? Is it still 6 nothing or no, what was it, 12, 13 no, nothing. 13 nothing. Okay. But the Raiders are driving. They just completed the first down. Jacksonville just called their first timeout. All right. So if something happens, we'll let you know. Yeah. Um, holy shit, we're about to hit the two hour mark. Uh, yeah. For those of you uh, still, for those of you still hanging with us, we appreciate it. But now you see why we're gonna keep sports generals going. But now you see why Chris and I are starting our own show. Yeah. All right. Now we get to the NHL. We've uh, got some news to cover, some free agency signings, and. Of course, every NHL fan's favorite game, where is Nazem Kadri going to go? Yeah, why has he not made a decision yet? I believe it. I believe it's he's trying to figure out what team has the most cap space to sign him. Colorado can't do it. Tampa can't do it. By the way, uh, Tampa just got, um, oh, what's his name? He played for them before, too. I don't know. It'll come to me. Uh, Columbus re-signed Emil Bemstrom. They also I, re-signed... In, I know this isn't recent news, but they re-signed Patrick Laine. They at also, the cost of Oliver Bjorkstrand. Yes, which... Hurts. <laughs> hurts you, because... Let's see, Raiders going for it on third down, and they do not... Oh, I'm sorry, that was second down, so now it's third and eight for the Raiders. All right. They are, I believe it looks like they are in the red zone, 13 to nothing, minute 42 to go in the first half. Derek Carr, hey. has, 
Derek Carr has not played a snap in this game. Yeah, I think I think if he did, if 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 the, it was the if it was the Raider starters with the Jaguar starters, I think the Raiders start. I think the Raiders would be up by a lot more than thirteen. All right, third and eight. Quarterback is scrambling. He's going to try and run for the first down, and he gets the touchdown. Touchdown, Raiders! And now it becomes nineteen to nothing. If they get the extra point, it will be twenty. If they go for two, it'll be twenty-one. Jared Stidham, the quarterback out of Auburn, former he, Patriots, uh, former Patriots quarterback who was uh, sharing a spotlight with Cam Newton for a season. Yep, he got traded to the Raiders to be Derek Carr's backup because they let Marcus Mariota go, and now to the uh, to the Atlanta Falcons. Which Atlanta, if you really wanted to get out of that rut you were in. Did you really just choose the guy who was benched for Ryan Tannehill because he couldn't play game? He couldn't play game manager. How, the ga a game manager quarterback is probably one of the easiest jobs. All you got to do is hand off the ball, and that's it. Well, occasionally throw. <laughs> Raiders may successfully kick the Falcons. extra point. It is 20 to nothing. Good. Um, but getting back to the NHL. So, actually, let's stay with Vegas. What did you think of them hiring Bruce Cassidy as their head coach? I would like to see what they'll do with it. But at the same time, their roster is not playoff worthy. They have Jack Eichel. But tell me, what's what what defense? Well, other than what they don't have a defense other than an aged Alexander Petrangelo. Yeah, this is uh, not the same guy that won the twenty twenty Stanley Cup or twenty nineteen Stanley Cup with the St. Louis Blues. This is an older version. Yeah, it's three years, but. He didn't look too good in Vegas the last couple seasons. No, he really didn't. Um, that we urinating tree brought this to light in his video about the Golden Knights. So we could talk for a whole. We could do a whole show just about the De Vegas Golden Knights. Maybe we will do that on our new show, Step It Up. At one point, again, we'll. When once Chris and I figure out the details of when that show is airing and what what day, what time, we'll let you know. Most likely, we'll be doing that show over on my YouTube channel, Unger to the Max. Um, so make sure if you haven't subscribed, so you'll know when we do those episodes. But uh, anyway, that cup, the run to the cup in. Cup final in 2018 in their first year existence was the worst thing that could have happened to the Vegas Golden Knights. They got too cocky, they stagnated, and they failed. And they failed, and they failed time and time again to make it back to where they took that magical run in 2017-18. Right. And they just kept, they just need to blow it all up, start from scratch, yeah, it'll be a painful few years, Vegas, but you'll have to deal with what every other team in the league will ha or has had to deal with before. Yeah, look a at, rebuild. Look at the Seattle Kraken. They were terrible th this past season. I honestly think that with the additions that they made with Oliver Bjorkstrand, Andre Borakovsky, and all that, they could be a playoff team. Yeah. Um,. I'm going to see if I can pull up the standings. Let's see. Yeah, see, Seattle finished in last place in the Pacific Division last year. They were 27 and 49. They didn't even get to 70 points. They finished with 60. Oh, yeah, that's not that's not a good finish. <laughs> hey, they weren't the worst team in the league though. That, that was the Montreal Canadiens who had the worst case of cup hangover 
I have ever seen. They went from making the Stanley Cup final, being almost on top of the world, to dead last. I mean, the only other team with a bad fall off was the Islanders. Yeah. But that's what happens when you lose the cornerstone of your defense and try to replace him with a near his retirement Zdeno Chara. Yes. Um and I get it. Like Montreal went from go being in the cup final to dead last. But I don't think they had it as bad as the Arizona Coyotes. Cause think about it. Arizona gets the city of Glendale says yeah, fuck you, Arizona. And they kick him out. Like, nope, we're not renewing. And, you know, they nearly got kicked out of Gila River Arena early because they couldn't figure out their tax situation. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That luckily, that was nuts. <laughs> luckily, they did figure it out, so they got to finish the rest of the season there. But... Now they're trying to get a new arena built in Tempe. We don't know if that's going to happen or not. But get this. They're going to be sharing an arena with the Arizona State Sun Devils. And I, if I remember correctly, the seating capacity for that arena, 5,000 people? It's, uh, you're close. It's, I believe it's somewhere close to 7,000 Maybe a little bit over 7,000. How pathetic is that? Like, most NHL stadiums have at least like 15, 16K. Oh, and I did just get some breaking news about the NFL that a 49ers tight end is out for the season with a... With a uh, torn ACL, I do not know. Let me actually pull this one up on my phone to see. My guess is that it's not George Kittle. And it would have been bigger news if it was Kittle, but I do want to see the name. Jordan Matthews. Oh, don't know him. He played for the Packers at one point. He was, uh, I believe he was one of Aaron Rodgers' guys, too. Gotcha. Uh, So. Oh. The Houston Astros are blanking the Cleveland Guardians right now. It is six to nothing. Oh, that's not good. Cleveland only has three hits. Oh, that's even worse. Yes. Um. Chris and I are looking to go to Sunday's game against Houston. So, well, if we do, we will most likely post some footage onto the Sports General's channel. And we'll put it into the Unger to the Max and Seaboss vlogs playlist on the Unger to the Max channel. Actually, I just renamed that playlist to be Step It Up. So, I'll, But whatever. But if we go on Sunday, which... Weather dependent. The matchup would be Christian Javier against Tristan McKenzie. Which I have not seen McKenzie pitch live this year. At least I don't think I have. It is halftime in the Hall of Fame game. And it is the Las Vegas Raiders 20 and the Jacksonville Jaguars nothing. So I think we... We are just over the two-hour mark. I think this is a good time to call it a night and end the show. But before we go, thank you to everyone who stuck around with us after Jason got off and continued to watch. We really appreciate it. Again, Chris and I are planning to create our own show. We'll give you the details about that once we iron all that out. But in the meantime, subscribe to Unger to the Max. Subscribe to the Sports Generals. Subscribe to Seaboss Gaming. I um I do streams every once in a while. I'm starting. To, I'm 
going to start a uh, daily streaming. I'm going to start a daily streaming schedule. I just hit Gold Viper on the 1911 in uh, Cold War. So maybe I'll hit more. <laughs> yeah. Hey, maybe we can set it up to where we can stream our show on your YouTube channel also. Yeah, no, I'd, um, I know, since I know how to kind of use StreamYard, that would, that would actually help me out a lot. Yeah, the thing with StreamYard is, though, is you have, in order to stream to multiple platforms, you have to upgrade to a paid version, so we'll see. Yeah. That's the annoying part, but we like using StreamYard, but anyway, we're, let's Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, so much for watching. If you like this, leave a like, comment, share. subscribe, yep. share. Um, and that's it. Peace. Yep. Rest in peace to Vince Scully. Rest in peace, Bill Russell. Yep. And NFL, please solve the Deshaun Watson situation before next Friday. That would be please. Greatly, that would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> Yeah, because I want to go into this preseason with no freaking worries. <laughs> yes. And uh, I can't wait for AEW All Out. Neither can I. That's going to be great. <laughs>